welcome to Money Talks. I'm Peter Switzer. Tonight we're going to try to work out how you should be investing if a future Prime Minister Bill Shorten plays around with the rules governing franking credits. The rule change doesn't only affect retirees in case the reaction to the rule change leads to the price of your stock, say, going down. And on the flip side, uh, uh, others could be chasing the, the kind of stocks that the retirees are, are looking after, which would be good for their share prices. So, in many ways, it could affect lots of Australians who play in the stock market. To help me with this franking fiasco, I have the former CEO of Comsec and star writer in the Switzer Report, Paul Rickard. Paul, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter. And his former employee, but now <laughs> the star of Bell Direct, Julia Lee. Thanks for coming to the program. Pleasure. And wearing Comsec colours too. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> All right, now guys, this is a really hot area and a lot of retirees are really worried about. Let's just do the discussion first. Paul, um, is it only retirees who are affected by the rule changes that Bill Shorten wants to introduce? Well, potentially everyone is affected if retirees become sellers, but let's just clarify who's actually impacted by the change. Yeah. Most of Paul, let's start with the people who aren't directly impacted. So foreign investors, uh, most Australian institutions, most Australian retail industry funds are not impacted. Uh, and nor are individuals paying tax at you know 37% or 47%. So it, it's only people on low a low tax rate under 30% who could be impacted. And then there are really the two types. We've got self-managed super funds in pension phase. They are definitely impacted. Uh, we have some zero rate taxpayers. That's people, for example, you know, the, a non-working spouse who might own some shares. He or she could be impacted. And self-managed super funds in accumulation mode. Look, it's a 50-50 question, depends on the asset mix, Peter, and also whether they're, how much tax they're paying. So, look, directly impact is only a small part of the market, but yeah. the impact for other investors will be if, you know, uh, people who are impacted decide to, to sell. And one of the yeah, fears... Dump stocks or yeah, one, stocks. one of the fears about this, of course, is we know lots of self-managed super funds in pension phase have lots of bank and Telstra shares, yeah. a disproportionate weighting of some of the major stocks. The question is, is if they take action. Now, I should also say some of that action may have already been taken. Yeah. So it's not a lay down there that mm. just because, you know, we get a change of government in mm. a couple of weeks' time, mm. not we can talk about whether the legislation will go through, but it's not a lay down there that people who are impacted will take action because some has already been taken. So Yeah, but, but, but for many ways, Paul, I would have thought more professional people would be. A lot of retirees would be they're praying that Bill doesn't win the election. I, I, think, so there lot, I think there are a lot of people praying that Bill doesn't win the election, or if he does, yeah. that we'll get a hostile uh, sure. cross bench. Sure. And, uh, you know, we, as we know with any taxation change that involves legislation, look, the fine print, how it's actually going to work, start dates, all those things that they've said, they could all be turned somehow around if it goes through the, the processes of the Senate. Okay, Julia, you heard your old boss. Did he make any mistakes with your largely No, agree? no, and look, one of the key points is the composition of the Senate. If there's no majority in the Senate, then it is up to the crossbenchers. And mm. if you have a look at the crossbenchers who are in, in the Senate at the moment, mm. they're all opposed to the... Uh, to the abolition of the cash refunds of imputation credits. Yeah. And, look, so, and sometimes it's not just the retirees that are impacted, although it's a minority. Sometimes it's people on redundancies or maternity leave that might be impacted. Mm. To me, if you want to, um, I guess, uh, try and, uh, I guess, ring fence the retirees into to one section, maybe you should have uh, imputation credits where you can defer it if you can't use it. And mm. that way, you know, people well, in situations like um, not having a job for a little while um, yeah. aren't impacted negatively. All right, okay. Uh, Paul and I have speculated that um, because if, if Bill gets in, a lot of advisors will start saying to their clients, well, property prices have fallen and the capital gains discount goes from 50% to 25% on January 1. Do you think there's a, there's a likelihood there could be a group of people chasing assets that have capital gain? Look, first of all, there might be a short-term impact, and I think investors have to weigh the short-term impacts versus the longer-term outlook. And while... Um, so responsible, <laughs> aren't you, the way you said that? I guess there's a couple of things. First of all, in terms of capital gains tax, yes, there might be a bit more in terms of volumes. In fact, I was talking to someone with a property business just on the couch before your show started, and she said, you know, all the prior elections she's worked through, mm -hmm. her, um, her business has basically gone flat. Mm -hmm. But this particular election has been quite different, and there's mm -hmm. been quite a lot of activity and that's probably because of the proposed changes to capital gains yeah. tax but in relation to shares 
you know, the US doesn't have a franking system. There's still a very strong home bias there. But because there isn't that strong dividend yield which supports companies, I guess there's a bigger focus on those companies over in the US to uh, chase growth rather than um, that stable cash flow that often comes from those more mature businesses mm. that offer those stable dividends. So did your old employer get it right then, Look, Paul? Look, she, she did. Uh, I agree with Julia. I think that the discount, the changes to the capital gains discount is actually a bigger impact than the franking credit, but that's probably a topic for another program. Yeah. But uh, and that's simply because I think we're going to get a uh, a December January precipice. In other words, you know, I expect that the market will be well bid. That's not just uh, share market, but also property come into December, and then come the first of January, no one want to touch anything. So there's a sort of a there's, there's a uh, a big sort of uh, mm. dip coming. Uh, potentially next year. So I think that's something to be wary about. So, but let's, let's talk about the franking credits uh, changes. Look, there are people impacted. And I think as Julie was saying, in some ways, look, it, it, although retirees potentially are going to be hit up front if it gets legislated, it may actually be good in some ways because they are as a group, and we're generalising here, too concentrated in too small a number of stocks. There's more diversification. And a bit more diversification into some of the other assets and some of the other stocks available in the market may be good and actually may encourage some of our companies mm. uh, to actually think a little more about growth. So I think that there could actually be a little positive from uh, this down the track. OK, now we've got a slide here, Paul, looking at the impact of uh, Frankie Credits and looking for alternatives, namely, uh, in this case, real assets. Why don't you just quickly talk to Yeah, them? so we break it down into three groups, Peter. Uh, real assets, financial assets and unfranked stocks. So when mm. I say real asset stocks, I mean stocks that actually own something. They actually own a building, yeah. they own a tollway, uh, or they own you know, a power play yeah. station. So they actually have something behind them. So the most obvious category are the property trusts, Peter, and they up, make up about 8% of the market. So it's, it's a big part of the Australian stock and market. And they're not franked. They're not Frank General Property Trust, Dexas, Centre, they're some of the leaders, but mm. there's more than 20 different property trusts. The reason they're not Frank, Peter, is because uh, they're usually uh, trusts that actually gear, so they borrow money, so they have high interest costs and they ha have high depreciation charges. So when they distribute the distribution to you, they're not paying any tax. So that's why they're unfranked. Mm. The second group are the classic sort of utility companies. So things like APA, Australian Pipeline, that owns a lot of gas pipelines. Uh, that's a good infrastructure, spark infrastructure involved in, in electricity. And then there's some other infrastructure owners in Transurban, uh, Sydney Airport, Auckland Airport, um, and across these stocks, you know, yields four to seven percent. So yep. lots of options. Generally, the better the quality asset, the lower the yield. Yep. That's an important thing. If some, an asset is promising a higher yield, generally it's a lower quality and, mm. and higher risk. Yep. But uh, lots of options in the, in the real asset type yeah. uh, stock part of the market. Julie, has Paul missed one that you would like <laughs> to put forward as a, as a good unfranked yield uh, playing type um, st stock? Well, Paul makes a great point in these other type of stocks with unfranked dividends, but the other side is that these are the stocks that benefit when interest rates are falling. They're thought of as bond proxies and mm. because of the large amount of borrowing that they have, mm. um, when interest rates fall, these share prices or unit prices usually go up. Mm. So if you and think that's happening now. Interest rates are probably the on market the market. Yeah. The market is pricing in two rate cuts here yeah. in Australia and globally as well. It looks like it is going to be lower for longer and that's mm. great news for these utility type companies, property trusts, um, the industrial companies like Sydney airports and Transurban mm. as well. But the, I guess the flip side is, if these stocks are being chased now because interest rates are on the way down, uh, the effective yield goes down when the share price goes up. Uh, I guess if you have a, a look at the yield side of the equation, most of the infrastructure type of stocks are regulated industries, so mm. you don't expect to see a huge amount of growth coming through in them. But mm. for example, um, Spark Infrastructure at the moment, expected dividend yield of 6.8%, mm. it is unfranked. Mm. Um, but you yeah. know, that's more than you'd be getting from a lot of even some of those franked, uh, fully franked dividends here in Australia. Yeah. I think the other thing, Peter, as Julia says, you've got to look carefully at the asset and uh, the generally the higher the quality asset has a lower yield but also you know in, inside the properties you know as we know just like we talk about residential property the commercial property market is very different there's a big difference between retail property trusts versus you know, office property or industrial property uh, so I think you've got to be look not just a matter of looking at the yield you also want to look at what you want to buy and also comparing 
you know, the value of the stock or the so-called what you're paying for it compared to the so-called net tangible assets. So what the, under, the asset's actually worth, because remember that all, the real asset stocks essentially just own assets, yeah. right, that pay an income. Mm. And, uh, you know, so you can actually, they'll publish what they call their NTA or net tangible asset value. And some of these property trusts are pretty expensive. They're trading at a premium mm. to what uh, yeah. theoretically would happen if they sold the assets and and, and dissolved the trust. So yeah. there's a little bit of caution required, but there there is it is a big part of the market, and certainly there are some attractive yields mm. available. Uh, but do your homework. Okay, so coming up, we'll shine the spotlight on which financial assets might get swept up in this franking debate. Welcome back. Tonight we're looking at how your portfolio could be impacted should uh, Bill Shorten become PM and start fiddling with the rules governing franking credits. We are going to look at f financial assets that might be worth chasing if the franking credit rules go, go against you. But before we do that, I'll ask Julia of the list that Paul showed, and Paul made the point he's not recommending all of those, those stocks. We asked Julia what ones that she likes from that list. Well, a couple stand out to me. First of all, Dexas. You know I like um, top-notch uh, office property here yeah. in Sydney. Yeah. Um, and look, because rents have been going up in Sydney, we're probably going to see an impact in terms of earnings over the next couple of years. And we've known from past history that that's the key with dividend stocks. You want to see that earnings stability and yeah. earnings growth to not only maintain that dividend, but hopefully grow that dividend over time as well. So yeah. I think Dexas is good. That's a tip. Good. Some of the other property companies um, out there, they're more second tier or on mm. the fringes of the CBD and look, I think there are higher risks there even though the yields are higher mm. and mm. they look initially more attractive. So I just think you have to be a little bit more cautious given, given the slowdown that we are seeing in terms of the domestic economy at the moment. The other one I like is Spark Infrastructure, three um, electricity distribution assets in Victoria and South Australia. Um, and look, 6.8% yield, there are still some risks there, there is something in front of the tax office that mm. we're watching very closely, but a yield of 6.8% over a number of years. I think okay, let's go. Two, two from me, Peter, uh, APA, which is of course the pipeline business. One of the main reasons for APA, of course, is that was actually uh, an overseas firm tried to pay $11 to take that over. That was mm. disallowed. That tells you how people offshore are valuing uh, APA, apart from being a pretty robust business. The other one, I'm a huge transurban fan, but maybe it's slightly lower prices. So. You know, if any dips in the market when Transurban gets sold off, that's an opportunity to buy that. Yeah, Paul likes to get a bit of his money back when he rides all those uh, um, well, all those motorways. Coal and they're just <laughs> all going away. So, um, but get Paul, used to it. do you think you're going to have a chance to get Transurban at lower prices, well, given look, that the market expects interest rate cuts? Well, not probably now. I mean, I, I never bought, bought the view that it was so interest rate sensitive, uh, because 98% of its borrowings are fixed. Uh, and it's only vulnerable to the rollover of those borrowings. But uh, look, I think, it's, I think it's still a great stock. Uh, it's just a monopoly business. There aren't too many other options. There's such low risk for me. Yeah. But uh, you know, in a market bearishness yeah. is the time to look at Buying it. Buying it in December would have been a smarter strategy. <laughs> OK, let's go and look at the financial assets now. And Paul's got another list here as well. To, um, so what are we talking about, Paul? Yeah, so let's talk at the, the second group. We talked about uh, uh, companies or trusts that own real assets. These are, at, these are financial trusts that own, in other words, things like financial securities, bonds, mortgage uh, bonds, uh, debentures and other types of securities. They've come to fashion recently. They've been around for a long time, but we've seen lots of so-called credit funds coming to the market. Yeah. Perpetual Credit Income Trust trading under PCI, that op IPOs and then comes to market, I think, the week after next. Uh, Metrics Credit Partners, they've, they've done two issues, uh, MXT. Uh, we've had an international group, uh, Newberger Berman, with their Global Corporate Income Trust, which invests in something like 500 different corporate bonds around the world. Yeah. So these are all um, trusts that are creating investing in other financial assets, uh, trying to, well-run trusts, trying to be diversified to mm. keep the risk to any specific asset down. Yields around 5 to 8%. Uh, some are paying distributions monthly, uh, yeah. which I think is the new part. So yeah. again, look, there's a, the market, the stock market's got lots of other things apart yeah. from BHP and CBA and some yeah. other and, stocks. And the so point you made earlier, the, the franking rule credits will make people diversify, and they might get surprised how uh, some unknown companies are actually pretty good dividend payers. Julie? 
Um, yeah, I guess if we have a look across the market, the reason why we get franking credits is because companies pay company tax here in Australia. So those companies not paying company <coughs> tax here in Australia are generally those making most of their money offshore. So yeah. the overseas owners, uh, overseas revenue companies or the ones that have had previous losses to offset again. So look, a big overseas earner is Macquarie Group. Yeah. It's coming up to its half year numbers. Mm. It's predicting 15% growth um, mm. and it's still in that it's financial stunning space. Stunning performance, hasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. So, um, really what, what percentage is franked with, with uh, Macquarie? I think, I think it's yeah, 45 to 50%. Yeah, so so. Macquarie Group's on my next slide, Pete, but yeah. look, that's alright. I mean, yeah. uh, I oh, think... Julie just jumped the gun to show this. She jumped the gun, that's alright. Uh, great minds yeah. think alike. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Occasion. But just going back to that last slide, so I mean these are essentially you know, financial trusts uh, and look I think it does highlight that the ASX has got lots of other things apart from companies, there are lots of other asset classes, bonds, you, you classify some of the things that these companies are investing as is I won't say risky fixed interest, but it's up the risk curve a little bit. That's why they're able to generate such high return. The secret here is diversification and the manager being yeah. really onto their game in terms of asset selection. And that's why you pay someone like a, a Newberger Berman who's been around so many years to actually manage a portfolio of these yeah. corporate bonds. I mean, the other thing is um, that is. There's so many options on the, the market, especially in terms of those financial trusts. But just be careful of those ones dealing in the hybrids because mm. hybrids do have yeah. large franking credits. So mm. those type of credit type trusts are likely to be impacted if yeah. we do see a change That's in That's a really franking. important point. And also, I don't want to talk my own book, but we do have a Switzer Dividend Growth Fund. And that portfolio of Sean Burns, his job is to find other companies that most people can't find. And I think those sorts of funds will become attractive to retirees because you know, there's 30 or 40 um, you know, dividend paying stocks in there which most people don't know. So I think if Bill changes the, the rules it could be good for those sort of funds. But maybe I can put you on the spot Peter. Okay, right, Are you yeah. doing things differently or would you do things differently in that dividend fund if we did see a change in the franking credit? Well at the end of the day that's going to be Sean Burns' role but we will talk to him about it. But uh, obviously the, the, the easy pickings will go but correct me if I'm wrong. No, look, I think you're right, Julia, because uh, that fund and there are others like it, which are uh, one of the rules that that fund has is it designs its return for zero rate taxpayers. Mm. And that's essentially because mm. of franking credits. Mm. Yeah. So if, if franking credits, zero percent taxpayers can't, you know, it suits lots of investors, but it, it does things like takes parts in off market buybacks because it can return much higher level of, of franking back to its underlying investors. Yeah. I guess that one of those things that those sort of transactions won't be available because yeah. mm. they won't be attractive. So mm. I think it will have to look a little differently at how it invests. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's one of the, I think we've actually seen a little bit of price appreciation in some of the unfrank stocks ahead of this change, potential change. Mm. Uh, and we're going to see more of that because some of the managed products will have to think, well, we've got taxpayers now, we've got investors in all sorts of different mm. tax situations. And the franking gold mine is not quite what it used to be. That's right. But I just think that the professionals will have uh, a, an advantage over the, the normal uh, retiree investor because they've got the research, they know what kind of companies. But you're right, the franking credits are going to change the, the way you play the game. And I guess the other thing is, are we going to have a golden period where we do get some more of those off market buybacks and those imputation credits being yeah, returned before, to yeah. shareholders before policy? Well, I think that's why we've had a golden period. <laughs> Whether we're going to get a couple is more it the between. End or Ready? No, well, we've still got till the end of June. I think the question that we're going to see this week is uh, is whether, for example, um, ANZ and National Australia Bank advance the p payment of their dividend to before July. In other words, get it done in June, just as Westpac has done. Uh, so that'll come out this week. Mm. Uh, but we have that other list of, of stocks. Yeah, to okay. Talk about. But we're going to do a break right now, and when we come back, we'll look at a whole lot of other companies that you know, don't pay any franking credits at all, but still have an acceptable dividend. Welcome back. We're looking at a world where franking credits are likely to change. So, and what could those changes do in terms of the stocks that you might be chasing? Uh, Paul Rickards has compiled a list of stocks that don't pay um, uh, franking credits, but are still pretty good stocks. Let's have a look at that list right now. Paul, why don't you start talking to it before we start? Yeah, look, of course, as Julia said, the reason that not all companies uh, frank their dividends, that's because they earn lots of money offshore. 
They pay tax to an overseas government, but they don't necessarily pay tax to the Australian tax office, and if you don't pay Australian company tax, you can't frank your dividends. So that's why companies, for example, like CSL, which is a top 10 company, number five or number six by market cap, industry leader, one of the best health companies in the world, doesn't frank its dividends. Now, that's there, it's forecast yield of 1.4%. I can't imagine a portfolio without CSL in it. I just think it's... I think a lot of retirees disagree but, with you. Know, if you haven't been in CSL, you've lost a huge amount. Yeah. Um, but there's some other names up there. Amcor, of course, which is uh, now global in, the, in its, its space of packaging of uh, yielding about 4%. Lend lease, 3.5%. Uh, it's now a very diversified company offshore. Julia mentioned Macquarie. It partially franks its dividends to 4 45%, a forecast yield of 4.3%. And again, fantastic growth. If you haven't been in Macquarie uh, in the last few years, you've really missed out. So, uh, it's, you know, remember Macquarie post the GFC got down to uh, oh. below $20 yeah, and now we're at $134 or yeah. something. So compare that to where the major banks have done. Look, a surprise for me is Janice Henderson, which is a fund manager, forecast yield of 5.7%. Yeah, I was just writing that down. I quite like the look of that. Oil search, if you're, if you're bullish on oil. And Pendle, another fund manager, 15% franking. It's paying a forecast yield of 5%. I think that's a pretty low, low risk bet, Pendle, yeah. uh, simply because of its, its business. And uh, it's been hit uh, after a slightly disappointing uh, for, uh, report the other day. But uh, that's one to look at. So the point is there are lots of stocks that Mm. Don't frank their dividends. Maybe Julia's got a, a favourite or two that. Uh... Two of my favourites on that list. One, I like to look for catalysts. So I like to see something coming up that might move the share price. So with Avcor, um, you know, yeah. it's in the packaging business, yeah. and scale counts in packaging. Yeah. So this uh, this merger with Vermis is going to be a big one, um, and it it is going to allow it into different geographies. It normally doesn't participate. Does that make Avcor well? the, the biggest? packager in the world or close to it? One of the largest and I think one of the most exciting things that could happen for the new Amcor is that it could be included in the S&P 500 index which of really? course means mm. that mm, passive uh, managers would be buying into it. Yeah, and of course you're, we're, we're, you're also saying here it's not just the dividend. You might go for a company that, that pays a 4% dividend but you're probably going to get a good capital gain for a company like Amcor the way you're talking it up you're actually you know boosting the share price as you speak. Okay, we know from stocks like Telstra and QBE Insurance, you yeah. can't just look at the dividend yield. There has to be an earnings, yep. underlying earnings story. And Amcor certainly has that. And it's got the catalyst of the synergies, the product, the, the bigger footprint, and possibly inclusion in the okay. What's the other index. one? What's the other one? Uh, the other one is uh, Boral. Now, it did come out with a profit warning earlier on in the year because the of wet weather. 4.8% uh, is okay. the forecast yeah. dividend, 50% frank. So there is some franking. Yeah. But uh, it was wet weather in the US. And look, rain doesn't last forever after yeah. the rain comes the sun um, so if we does see more normalized activity we should see a boost in the it, sector. It's also a stock that's gone through a lot of highs and lows in the market. Uh, under the previous CEO, went to a high, then came down. Then the whole market got excited about Boral about 18 months ago, went yeah. to about $7 or something, and the whole market doesn't like it anymore. Yeah. And, um, it's, it, it's, can, it it's, can disappoint, Paul. It, can dis it has a history of both surprising on the upside and disappointment, but it's certainly been sold off a long way. And um, First quarter GDP in the US, 3.2%. Yep. So it? getting exposure to that US story. Yeah, yeah. Now look, before we finish, just quickly, do you suspect that the franking credits will be um, changed by the Senate um, if, if Bill Shorten becomes Prime Minister? Oh, I think it depends on the crossbenchers. As it is at the moment, it doesn't look like either party is going to get majority in the Senate and it's up to the crossbenchers. Yep. And the current crossbenchers are all opposed to the abolition of the excess franking credit right. refund. OK, Paul. I think the most likely outcome, Peter, is a cap. That'll be easy for the crossbenchers to say to because there's still an argument. You know, there are a small it's number of self-managed super yeah. funds getting so-called millions of dollars in, in in cash refunds, but we know that's just a, a handful. Small number. But that's something. You know, there's an argument about equity, but uh, I guess I think some sort of cap which would take that off the plate for the bulk mm. of of the million 1.1 million people impacted uh, is probably the most likely outcome, and maybe something that both sides can deal on. But mm. you know, a long way to go on that. I don't think there'll be a majority. Uh, an ALP Greens majority in the And if it gets through, maybe short some of the things that retirees like to buy, like caravans and holidays from bricks and mortar companies. That's for another show, Julia. <laughs> Julia Lee, Bell Direct, Paul uh, uh, Ricardo from Switzerland Financial. Thanks for joining us. That's the show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. By the way, we still have some tickets left in both Melbourne and Brisbane for next week's Switzer Strategy Day. Just go to switzerevents.com.au if you want to ha hang out with some of the best fund managers in the country and smart people like Paul Ricard. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.